gorgeous. So, um, yeah, wait for some folks to enter. Beautiful. All right. So, can we uh, go ahead and get started? Um, I'm so, so, so honored. Ooh. Someone's uh, phone to speak. Sorry. So. That's okay. You're, you're very popular, I know. I'm but, very um, <laughs> in any case, uh, welcome everyone to um, the first part of a three part series for the home series at the Transgender District. Um, I am so honored to be joined here with three other very phenomenal um, people of the community who are here to speak about their experiences and their lives and kind of just any beautiful stories that they have as folks who are immigrants and who are trans identified. Um, and yeah, so without anything further ado, I'd love each um, of our, our uh, almost like contestants, each of our panelists here to go ahead and um, speak a little bit about yourself um, and about your experience. And um, with this, I'm going to put you up on screen as the main person alongside uh, the slides that you've created um, with the photos that you've sent in, um, which of course was optional for those in the audience that are wondering. Um, but in any case, let's go ahead and start with introductions. Um, why don't we go by the alphabet? Uh, Aishani, would you be happy to go ahead and start? I will pull everyone else off screen. Yep, that's perfect. I can start. And then I will add I'm this. I'm going to derail from the traditional introduction route, and I'm going to go a little bit of a story style, so bear with me. Um, so Amar Shonar Bangla and Bineka Tungal Ika, these are two phrases in the languages I grew up in, Bengali and Indonesian respectively. Both of these phrases hold great pride among the people who speak these tongues. Bengal is a state in the east of India with colonial architecture and Indian soul. Nature flourishes and people eat rice and fish three times a day. And my favorite memory is of eating a delicious dessert we call mishti doi standing at a food stall with the hustle and bustle of the city brushing against my back. So comforting. My other home, Jakarta, is the capital of Indonesia, a modern city with rich culture and spicy chili sauce called sambal. My favorite memory there is eating a salad called gado gado, sitting at the food stall in the parking lot with my school, with my, with my friends. As you can see, there's a theme. I like sitting at food stalls. <laughs> The pride of these two cultures was constantly instilled in me from a very young age. But somehow, somewhere, I just couldn't feel this pride and I couldn't place my finger on it. Throughout my childhood, as I slowly discovered myself, I grew into the unfortunate realization that I would never feel that pride because my culture would never be proud of me. And so I left. I packed my life in two suitcases and hopped in a plane to finally run towards my dream, towards Aishani. Since that moment, my life has taken me on an incredible journey. I'm so grateful for, from going to my dream school to meeting folks I call my chosen family, to transitioning, all because I leaned into my truth and not a mold that didn't fit me. That's my introduction. Oh, thank you so much. I'm gonna add all folks back to the stream. Um, thank you so much, Aishani. That was so beautiful. Like you painted a incredible picture of like your home culture and like of immigration. And oh, let me pull down this banner so we can see Uchi's beautiful face. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for that. And um, we'll we'll go to the next uh, panelist to talk about their experience, and then we'll have a quick moment to you chat about um, each person's uh, introduction. Um, Y'all can ask each other questions if you'd like. It's really an open-ended uh, conversation. And then once that's done, we'll be able to move to um, these pre-prepared questions that I'm going to present for folks to openly answer. So next folk I'm going to ask to um, step up to the plate is Aluchi. So um, Aishani, thank you so much. And then Jupiter, stand by. And I will move to the next slides. 
And Aluchi, um, I had I put your photos into separate slides so that just to make sure that's visible for everyone on our YouTube and um, Facebook. So um, it, without any further ado. Hey y'all, uh, my name is Aluchi. Uh, I use any pronouns. Um, so my people come from Ibo land, which is now um, the nation state of Nigeria, Southeast. Um, yeah, when I think about my home, um, it, it brings up a lot. Uh, my parents were born in Nigeria um, and I was actually born in the United States. So I am the child of immigrants. Um, but growing up my cultural heritage, who I was, where I came from was, was really ingrained in who I was. Um, this is at Ebo Fest, it's actually the same year. Um, it's a testament to like how I've grown um, and the femininity and the masculinity that I have inside of myself um, and being able to be fluid in my, in my gender expression, regardless of like how I, I was assigned at birth. Um, so yeah, Ebo people are great, Nigeria is great. Um, I remember a story that I'll, that I'll tell is um, the first time that I went to Nigeria was actually in the year 2000. Um, and this was obviously when I was like seven or eight years old. Um, I was very much so told I was supposed to be a girl. This is how I'm supposed to be conditioned, all of these things. Um, but I still remember just feeling safe and feeling like, like I could be at ease um, in that homeland. Um, Fast forward 20 years, two decades, um, I actually got the opportunity of going back to Nigeria um, after um, I've transitioned both socially and medically. Um, and I was super anxious about going, right? Like my name means God's work. It is very feminine. So like, if you know Ibo, she is a very feminine quote unquote name. So I had a lot of anxiety about going back because I was like, oh shit. Like people are gonna know that quote unquote, I was supposed to be a girl. I'm like very masculine identified. I wear masculine clothing. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, and Nigeria is one of the countries that criminalizes like homosexuality and LGBTQ identities, right? Um, so I was like, and I was going for work. Um, I, I'm the co-executive director at BLMP. So we were doing, we were actually um, there for organizing to um, connect with LGBTQ activists that um, are working in Nigeria. And I just was, I just remember being super fucking anxious going there. And I remember just like getting out of the airport and just feeling like a sense of ease that I was supposed to be there in that time, in this body, in this spirit, in, in all of it. Um, and I was like, wow, this is what home actually looks like. This is what home tastes like. This is what home feels like. It tastes like jello rice. It tastes like the swallow and soup that I've been eating. Uh, thank you for switching the slides. It looks like masquerades, right? So this is um actually this is actually a picture that I took. And um, we have uh, these things yearly called Ebo Fest, which is just a celebration of our culture. This is from a while ago, but this is called the Benda War Dance. It actually comes from like my specific part of Nigeria as well. So it's just a war dance that has been done for centuries and centuries. Um, and it's like really important and special to my culture. Um, but yeah, so like, that's a little bit of an introduction from where I come from, um, my story, um, and yeah, where, where, where we're going. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Oluchi. That was so beautiful. And I wanted to move to the next slide. And can you all hear me? Okay, thank you so much. Oh, we had some technical difficulties on our side. So um, it sounded like the speaker on our end cut out. I think perhaps my AirPods died, you know. But in any case, Jupiter's uh, here in the same room with me. We share office space and um, it's so beautiful to be able to be joined by you all. I'm going to introduce a bit of my story and Luchi. Um, I'm so excited to chat a bit about your trip to Nigeria after this. I have so many questions. And um, with that, I will go in to uh, my story a bit and then we will follow up immediately with Jupiter's. Um, thank you so much. Let me um, put us on the front of the screen. And beautiful. All right. So um, my name is Jennifer Yoon. I am a trans woman of color based in the Bay Area. I'm an artist. I am a creative. 
Um, I work for the transgender district uh, alongside of other amazing um, trans folk uh, on behalf of trans folk. Um, but my homeland is actually in South Korea. So my family is actually all um, on my mother's side from uh, a small island actually called Jeju-do. And Jeju-do is an island off the southern coast of the peninsula of Korea. And there, there's actually a strong um, history and culture of uh, shamanism and Buddhism that was um, in some ways less touched by the movement in the 70s, 80s, and 90s of westernization um, in that nation state. Uh, as a result, my mother was very superstitious. She was very much um, believed in different sorts of uh, spirits and things of that nature. And I feel like that really colored my upbringing. Uh, unfortunately, she passed when I was quite young and uh, the, the story of mine is that I was actually taken in by my father's family, who is actually, um, you can see in the center here where I'm dressed in this very like ornate little jacket um, is my Dolchanshi, which is my 100 day birthday. And essentially uh, he was a white military man. And so I had this huge cultural shift um, as a child, like growing up in Korea and then moving to the States and having to um, really uh, assimilate at a young age to the culture that is here. And then on top of that, um, with me coming into my identity, um, that kind of uh, butt heads with my father's staunchly Roman Catholic belief system. So um, that led me to finding, having to have independence at a very young age, um, moving away, not right, running away um, in truth. And then as a result, um, having to make my way and rebuild relationships with my culture and um, particularly with my family that still is in this world. So um, I think my experience as a trans person and as diaspora is unique. And I think that's what's beautiful about this talk is that um, I feel we brought together four very unique stories and I'm so stoked to continue speaking and asking questions and exploring how all of us who share a common, a commonality can really have these really unspoken truths that we hold and understand of each other. So, and then let me add everyone to the stream again. And I'm actually going to close out the screen share. And I will let Jupiter jump in. Um, do you want the full screen for yourself? Or would you uh, rather just have us in the full circle now? Let's just have us in the full circle. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Jupiter Peraza. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am also a program associate at the district. And um, unfortunately, I don't have any uh, pictures to show like all of my, um, my co-panelists. Um, and the reason why is because I, I really don't have a lot of uh, physical, tangible memories of my childhood. Um, and I really wish I did. Um, my my family came from a very poor uh, rural town in uh, in northern Mexico from this from this area of uh, Sinaloa, which is where my uh, where both my parents are from, um, and I was born in this um, state uh, in in, some, in uh, Mexico, which is just um, the next state over, which is called um, Sonora. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, I often very much um, think about this when I'm always thinking about how far I've come. Um, but, you know, my mother, she was born in a, in a hut that was made of mud and sticks. Um, you know, just to give you an inference as to sort of um, where I come from and how that has informed uh, my narrative now. Um, I came to the United States when I was um, eight years old and I resided in uh, Southern California in LA, which is where I grew up for um, part of my childhood. Um, and, you know, at the very beginning, it was very much of a culture shock for me uh, to go from um, a Mexican city and rural towns in Mexico from where my parents are from to this new culture um, you know, especially it being Southern California, um, Los Angeles, which is a huge cultural um, center for, you know, American culture. 
Um, and that was sort of, uh, um, sort of my world was flipped, uh, um, was flipped upside down. And it, it took me quite some time to get accustomed to the language and the relationships and school and friendships. And, you know, just, just living in a place that to me felt so tame. Um, in Mexico, I definitely did have the liberty of being with family and uh, with neighbors and friends and, you know, longtime family friends. Uh, so, you know, that's definitely something that very much informed um, my upbringing, um, being alone and, you know, being an only child. Um, so, um, yeah, and, you know, that, that, that definitely did inspire me to, you know, pursue um, what I wanted to pursue as an adult, to be honest with myself, uh, to stand in solidarity with who I was and what I wanted to do, because I, I, you know, I felt like I spent so much of my time um, living in a world that to me didn't really feel like my truth culturally. Um, and that definitely did uh, inspire me to, you know, be who I am today, which I'm very proud and very, um, lucky to be. And that's just me. So, yeah, I honestly am just so blown away by everyone on this panel and the fact that like, I, I'm actually like having this like mental image of like where our homelands exist as, like on an actual map of the world and thinking about how we are all here in this moment speaking mm -hmm. about these experiences um, and just the miles, the, the miles we've traveled the, the sort of stories of our ancestors and how we carry that with us. Mm -hmm. And I think kind of this conversation is just so important in this time where there are talks about like, what is home for trans people, but then also mm -hmm. like about things like land and ownership or like sort of what does the land actually look like? Um, what are borders looking like? Like we just came out of, you know, a very particular like administration that had a very strong stance on borders. Mm -hmm. And just as folks who now live in America, which is seen as this like, you know, what is commonly called, I'd say stereotypically a melting pot. Like mm -hmm. what is it that's actually melting together and what yeah. is actually staying true to our cultures? Um, so I wanna open it up to all of the rest of the panelists to ask questions now to each other a little bit about introductions, if there's any particular ones that pop up. Um, I know I have like, a couple, <laughs> but um, just to be mindful of time, then we'll move on to the uh, the primed questions so that we can have a, a round table together. Um, thank you so much. So, any any questions popping up for each other? I actually wanted to ask Aluchi, um, you know, with your trip to Nigeria. I, I actually, something like clicked in me when I was listening in, um, in particular to having to ask yourself now or like yourself then even, like going back there. Um, I've, I've traveled back to Korea before, but I have not actually traveled back to my mother's like home in the island. And I guess like with that, I think it's like my question really deals with like, what was the feeling when you just like first stepped down into that space? Like for me, I felt like it was gonna be this really scary experience, but I immediately, like there's this connection to earth that I was just like, this is insane. So I wanna hear a little bit about that from you. Yeah, um, that's funny. And uh, I resonate because I actually, when I went back to Nigeria, I haven't gone back to my homeland, like the actual village that my parents are from, um, but I will be, going back in December. So that's giving me a little bit more anxiety because when I went back, it was like, I was in Lagos, I was in Abuja, which are like very two main cities. So like, it's basically like going to New York City if you're from rural, whatever. Um, so it's definitely different, but I do remember like, I vividly remember like how my body felt. I remember it was hot as fuck. Um, it was like 80 degrees and humid. And I just remember stepping off the plane and like, even though the air was so thick, it just felt like I could breathe more and clearer and like lighter than I had ever felt before. Um, and I was just affirmed in like my identity so much more than I thought I was going to. Um, 
And I think that's also like trans mask privilege, right? People were reading me as male. So like, obviously like people who are read as male get treated differently, better than people who are read as femme or female. So like, just like uplifting that. But like, yeah, I, I, I felt, I felt very affirmed um, and continuously felt affirmed. And even like going out, I just remember going out and like everyone that I, that I met going out, they're like, yeah, I'm gay. I'm like, I'm like this, I'm like that. And I'm like, wow. So the, the picture that is painted of like Africa of Nigeria is actually not what it is, right? Like people actually don't care. Um, and like people are still thriving. People are still trans, people are still queer and they're so prolific there. And it was just like, it was really affirming to like see that and be able to meet people who also like shared my identities. Yeah, I, that's also something like, there are so many like queer people, like queer ass people out there. And that's like, that's also something that surprised me is like going out and just realizing that like how normalized and like we have this idea that like by going to a place where there are more conservative values that like somehow mm -hmm. we, that our people don't find a way to exist, but like we're out here, like we exist and that's what's beautiful. Um, any other last comments or questions before we move on to the current questions? I have a comment. No, that was so, so interesting to hear Alucha's experience because I haven't gone back yet. Yeah. So I don't know what that would even be like, but that's so true in terms of we exist in whatever situation that is there. So it's it's really like refre refreshing to to be witness to that concept. I agree, like, when I went back to Korea, and I, I speak, I also realized that, like, saying that I'm like, having been able to go back to a place that my ancestors call home is, like, a privilege in its own ways, in some ways, like, it's also, I also see it, see it as a right, as, like, someone who's, like, life is uprooted, um, to be able to have that, so I think, like, that's kind of a belief system mind that we strive towards, is that, like, Folks like us should have every right to be in those like ancestral places, regardless of the values that the people there hold. Like mm -hmm. we carry that with us as a, an alienable right, but unfortunately the world we live in isn't raised um, in that same vein. So it's just totally agree. And I'm, I'm hoping that like both Jupiter and I shall me that like the world changes every day and then, like mm -hmm. we're all in the same battle I feel like towards finding pathways to getting folks back to their homeland. And it's just something I'm really passionate about. And so I, we brought this back today. Yeah. So it's so beautiful to hear. But um, I'm going to start the prime questions. Um, is there any last questions? Okay, beautiful. The first question, and I'm really excited to share this, uh, is really, it's a kind of an idea of like what is defining for each person. Um, and it seems like a no-brainer, but what does home mean to you? Um, and I want to pick on nobody, so I'll let y'all popcorn. But this question, actually, I was I was sitting with it and just realizing that like, I'm just not sure I see. So, <laughs> not for me. What does home mean to you? I actually wrote some. Um, some things about what home means to me. Let me just grab my book. But um, um, home to me, uh, because it's something that it took me a long time to build and to nurture. Uh, home is where uh, I feel empowered. Um, it is where I feel creative. Uh, and most importantly, it is where I feel free. I feel like it's, it's, it's very important to uh, really uh, think about what you feel um, when you are in a place where you feel comfortable, where you feel like you aren't being watched, where you feel like there aren't uh, things in your surroundings that you are uh, looking out for. Um, I think it's very important to take that into consideration because for a very long time, um, I felt like I was limited in how I could express myself. And I realized to myself, this is not, this is not a home. It is not something that I look forward to going to because uh, it, it means that I cannot um, be myself. Um, and you know, something about the, uh, something about being an immigrant that I think is so beautiful is that um, 
there's something about the resilience of immigrant individuals of being able to make a home of anywhere that you are, um, which I think it's our own special talent. It's our own special, um, you know, superpower, if you may. Um, but I, you know, I just think it's very critical um, to you know learn to foster uh, a place uh, where you feel like you know you are unlimited and there there aren't things that hinder you. And to me, that is what home is. Yeah, I that a lot. Oh, yeah. Um, that I love that, and I think for me, like when I think of home, I think of it like home is like a noun. I love it. I hate it when people say love is a, a noun and an action, but I do think that that's like for me, like that is what home is because home is also an active choice, right? Like you choose the homes that you are that you that you seek, right? And I do like I think of home as a state of mind, a place where we can have a grasp of liberation in our lifetime, right? And like we all feel as free and um, validated as we can. Um, home is where we can practice tools of, um, of survival and liberation with each other. Um, I think of like home as like the the community that I built with like my chosen family and my friends. I'm um, like, that is like, that is a home that I cannot thank my like thank everyone enough for. Um, and then I also think about like political homes, right? Um, just to like rewind a little bit, when I like first came out as queer and trans, I remember like completely discarding my cultural identity and being like, oh, I can't be Igbo anymore because Igbo people and queer people don't actually exist at the same intersection, right? Um, and I didn't know any other like African people or queer people that were also Igbo. So I was like, oh, this is like a white thing. And like, I guess I'm gonna be like the Oreo and whatever. And I just remember like the first time that I met someone who was Nigerian and queer, the first time I met another trans Igbo person. And I was just like, wow, like this is a home. And like together we create an organization that holds people like us like that, that people can find community in. And like, when I think of my political home, I think of BLMP. Like I think of like a place where we can actively work towards dismantling systems that have kept us apart for thousands of years. Um, and like, so like home is like very important. And I think the most important thing is that like, we are able to recreate home when when our homes don't see us, right? Um, like, I, there's many, many stories of like how the home that we were born into does not validate us and how we had to find other homes. We talk about like house house culture, ball culture, like that is home. Like those, that is, those are definitions and examples of what like home is for trans people, specifically trans people of color um, and how like important home is to us. Yes, I'm, I yes, love that. I'm like, ooh, I got I actually got goosebumps. Like, like you talking about. I'm so sorry, but like you saying, like how you never knew someone from your culture that was like you, and just like feeling like you had to reject that, like as a way of like you know assimilating to what you thought was like your true identity. Like that gave me because like it's it's this world that teaches us that we have to throw away parts of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So like that, like the fact that like you came like full circle and were able to find someone of your community, mm -hmm. of your culture, and they like, you built something bigger even um, for folks like you. That's like, oh, I live. So, um, and I wanna say like, again, like these questions are prime questions and like y'all can feel free to answer them as you like. You can skip them if you want, but like I would, Hi, Shani, I would love to hear yeah. from you as well. Like, um, I like hearing from everyone, but like, I always understand that my people are They don't always know, so um, we'll, we'll go ahead and um, let I, Shani speak. And yeah, no, really I loved, loved what everything, everything that was mentioned. I love specifically that home is an action. Like that is such a wonderful way of seeing that. And I've grappled with this concept of what does home mean for me and and throwing away parts of myself because I was like, oh yes, it, being queer is, is, is a white thing. So like, I, I, I guess I'm <laughs> like coconut now. <laughs> um, but um, for so long, I, I couldn't really answer that question. And I think I still struggle a little bit with answering that question, but I see it in three pillars. I see, first is myself and that's come a long way too like 
and this concept of home as an action ties to that. Like I, we have to change, I guess not change, we have to come to our bodies in the way we want to. And that's how I see my transition as, in order to create the home that I wanted to create, right? And then there's, so that's within myself and that's, that goes with me wherever I go. Like I am my own best friend and I've had to come to ter like re terms with that and really love myself and take myself on dates, which has been so cool. <laughs> um, and then second, I see my people and there, I've met so many incredible people throughout my life and they're spread all over the world, but they feel like home to me. They feel like little like sparkling dots of home spread around a global map and it's incredible. Um, and then lastly, I feel like the Bay Area kind of feels like, has started to take the shape of home. I Even before I came here, it was like this beacon of hope that called my name. And it was a home that I'd never even seen, but it felt like home. So when I came here, I was like, oh my God, I'm home. So that's, it's just, it's interesting. Absolutely. I think I totally, I hear you and I agree. I think it's interesting because I think with the transgender district, the, our organization, um, a part of our, our mission is really rooted in creating a space that can live on for a hundred years that like trans people can turn to and say like there is a place on this world that is dedicated for us by us that has a history that is rich in like resistance and like, like in survival and in like in in solidarity. The thing that I I feel kind of in frequency with is just this idea of like being able to understand that home might not be physical, but it is the idea of like safety. And I think for myself, the way I was raised and like my realities is that I moved around maybe every two years of my life, like not just like houses, but like like from like you know entire different lands and i think that's the harsh reality of like being born into a system that was like my father's system which is like very militaristic this idea that you have to move around and like you know do these efforts that actually are like developing for capitalism and i think what home to me slowly became was not like the physical it's it's just this very much like spiritual idea to me that like our home lives in our bodies yes but it actually lives in our spirits too that like we carry with us the ability to to create a hearth that we carry with us the ability to create a space of shelter for weathering any storm whenever we want to and i think that's why like i see home in other people too mm -hmm. um and it's always just it's like very much like how do i say it comforting when you see people that have a shared experience with you like that, mm -hmm. that are immigrants. And there's just like a, I almost like, it sounds really mad cheesy, but I'm like, I see a twinkle in their eye, I'm like, you get it. You know? and like, it, it's just like this weird moment where I always feel there's that like shared bond. Yeah. Um, I also think that's the truth of, you know, why San Francisco became the home of, of, of the transgender district. I think it was one of our co-founders that said it, um, Janetta Johnson. She said that um, the reason why people were coming to San Francisco, uh, uh, trans people, is because they knew that in San Francisco they could find a home um, where they can find a community. And I think it's something that we've heard over and over again in many of the experiences of not just trans people, but of, um, um, of people in the LGBT community. And you know, we we always read about and see about uh, people that live in small towns wanting to go to big cities like New York City or LA, or in our case um, of traveling internationally to a place where we know is sort of, that is like San Francisco means um, freedom to me. And, and you know, in Aishani's case, the Bay Area is home, it's, it's hope. Um, and, you know, I always think that we create this sort of idea of where we want to go and where we want to be that I, I, I think it's a very common um, narrative for trans people. And I think that unites us. It's very beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I feel like we could talk about this question yeah. for like an hour. Yeah, but what does it mean to you? 
oh, I already said I was like the spirit baby. But <laughs> um, I think I need to go back to my etiquette classes. You're supposed to repeat the question back and then say the answer. But oh, yeah, I, I just honestly felt like so on frequency with everyone here that I just, I just love that like the iterations of like how home is in action, home are these pillars, mm -hmm. and like home is a place where we feel empowered. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And if those are just what we take away from it, we want to like, oh, like that like printed and plastered, and the walls are printed and plastered. In any case, um, I want to go on to the next question. And this one's kind of a long, it's like a very, it's a breathy question. Yeah. But um, I want to hear from all three of you because I feel like this is a very it's like one of those ones that we could go really deeply into. Yeah. Um, and that is, can you tell us about your journey as someone who is an immigrant or diaspora to identifying and how has that intersected with your journey as a TGI person? So I think this is in particular about that intersection, like Alufi mm -hmm. was mentioning, just mm -hmm. like um, the action of like, do we dispose of this? Do we mm -hmm. accept it? Do we change it? Do we transform it? So. Mm -hmm. um, and I will just make that real easy for us. Identity intersection. I love that question. question. Yeah, love that question. Yeah. Um, well, I was really thinking what Aluchi was saying about um, how you went back um, back to Nigeria. Um, and you know, I, like Aishani, I haven't had the opportunity to go back to Mexico um, in a very long time. So as I come into my transhood and my womanhood, um, I feel like there's a I feel like there's a disconnect uh, in terms of my child self and um, my adult self, um, and it's something that I've been trying to understand and sort of translate uh, to inform myself right now. Um, and yeah, you know, I. Um, I, I think there are so many things in our within us that we try to discard because we want to assimilate into this new culture. Uh, but you know, I think it's also very important to take everything that you garnered um, as a child, or you know, or the person that you were before you came to this new place. Um, and I, I still think that it's still within us, but it manifests in ways that we can't really comprehend and that we, that we can't really understand. And, you know, my, my, uh, my journey as an immigrant um, is a journey that can be described as, um, as longing. I feel like I long for something that I can't really, really explain. Um, I feel like I I long for my for for being authentic, um, and not necessarily authentic in in the way in it's it's not in the way of I am not the person that I am. I'm definitely the person that I am and that I want to be. But I want to be someone that is informed by my culture, in my history, in my background. Um, and it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's something that I still have not been able to, to understand fully. Um, and I think I never will be able to understand until I am able to visit my homeland again. And I am able to um, feel uh, the energy of the places that I was when I was a child. Um, I, I feel like even then I will find a way to translate those feelings and those emotions into the person that I am today. But you know, also this longing has definitely allowed me to um, to seek more um, self discovery within myself as a trans person. I feel like this longing has um, has been the fuel uh, to this fire of wanting to be honest um, with who I am and uh, where I come from, and um, and I am always very honest, and I always say that. Um, that I miss exploring where I'm from and that I, I wish I knew more and, and, and that I wish that I had more to sort of talk about, um, like the food um, and the weather and the people and the clothing and, and, and the colors and the language. I wish I had that um, and it would make me really happy. But in the meantime, I have an idea and I am chasing it 
And in this chase, I am also informing, um, you know, the foundation of the person that I want to become, if that makes any sense. I hope I didn't confuse y'all. <laughs> I saw you like, hmm. <laughs> I think no, it makes total sense. Yeah. The longing aspect is like so yeah. real. It's so real. And it's like, it's almost so, like the feeling is so intense that it's yeah. tangible. You can like, you can actually touch it. It's yeah. Almost, like in yourself. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I relate to that longing aspect so much. And you put it so beautifully in, in, I feel like, um, my transness and my and my immigrantness has been so harmonized throughout my life and and i i think the longing concept is such a such a defining aspect of that you know in whether for a narrative that i was trying to live in whether for a culture that i was trying to exist in they were all sort of tied together but um for me i think going back to the points of how we had to throw parts of ourselves away as we were transitioning and coming into ourselves. I did a lot of that because I felt like I couldn't be both and I couldn't lead that intersectionality, but then also being queer and trans and South, from the South Asian diaspora, I did meet a few folks that were queer and trans and, South, and from the South Asian diaspora and who were, except the immigration part, right? Except the Im immigrant part. They were, they were the, the people who either immigrated here as a child or, immigrate or, or were born here, but they were so tied to their South Asian diaspora and they visited India or um, you know, different countries in South Asia and were tied to that culture. And so we would engage in these, di in these difficult conversations of what it meant to straddle the line of South Asian and trans, but it always felt like a disconnect. I, I always felt a little bit alienated. I felt like I wasn't, um, and it was, it was just so difficult. It was challenging to really understand where that was coming for, from, but I think I tie it back to being in those conversations, talking about the culture and how there are aspects of the culture that don't necessarily agree with us. I felt in my mind that it was a harsher reality since I was so closely tied to that, you know? Um, and it took a long, long time to really be in those spaces more comfortably and being in those conversations more comfortably. But that was a key defining aspect of my journey straddling that intersectionality. Absolutely. It's interesting too, like when you meet other people, like I, I have these simultaneous moments where like when you meet other people from your place that you, your, your, your place of like, you know, where your family is from, your ancestry is mm -hmm. from, and that are also TGI, it's mm -hmm. like, it reminds you like that everyone has their own unique experience because mm -hmm. like I've had moments where it's just like they're so different like and they see things so different mm -hmm. so I think that's so important to know that there is that uniqueness of like carrying your own story Richie mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I would love to hear from you yeah um so I think <laughs> it's important in every panel to just cement that I'm definitely a Leo um, and I have a very strong, like, sense of self. Um, me and Aishani actually have the same birthday, so shout out to birthday twin. Um, yeah. <laughs> but um, as a kid, I think it, it was interesting because, like, I had a very strong sense of self. I think that I was fed a lot of things as a child that made me second guess myself. Um, I remember when I was, like, four years old, um, I was, like, playing outside with, my cousins and like their neighbor kids. And they, we were just talking like stupid, like child shit. And they were just like, oh yeah, if you have a crush on someone then you should kiss them. And I remember there was like this like cute neighbor girl um, and we were just playing. And like, I remember like I kissed her on the, on the lips, just like very adorably. Um, and my cousin stopped me and they were like, no, you can't do that. And I was like, why? You all said that if you like people, 
Or if you like someone, then you kiss them. And they're like, yeah, but you're a girl and you don't kiss, like girls don't kiss other girls. And like in that moment, I was like labeled as one, I was labeled as a girl and two, I was labeled as straight. Um, and then I like, I, I like, I think I shiny, I, I resonate with what you were saying, but I think like for me, it was like the, these two identities were running parallel to each other and like they actually could intersect. Right. And like, because I was this thing, because I was black, because I was Igbo, like, we don't do that. Like, that is not something that we do. And I felt as though, like, I had to discard this, this piece of my identity. Um, and then like, as I talked about before, when I like, didn't, couldn't do that anymore, like physically, mentally, emotionally, like I then had to discard like my cultural side and my Igbo side. Um, and I think it's interesting that this is called home slash land because I think about like all of the violence that has happened on our homelands. I um, mean, I specifically think about like Christian imperialism. I think about like colonization of Africa. I'm uh, thinking about like the pillaging of our um, of my people and of our people, right? Um, and actually how homophobia, transphobia has been institutionalized by white supremacy and co colonialism. Um, in the last like couple of years, um, as like, I've been more validated in my cultural identity with like finding and like being around amazing queer and trans, like black African migrants. Um, I've been learning and like studying deeper around um, my ancestral, uh, my ancestral spirituality. Um, so my ancestors actually practice something called Odinani, which is like not Christianity, but it's like their, their version of spirituality. And like the number one, lesson that has like really resonated with me and like has made me realize like oh wow this is actually who i'm supposed to be is like this idea of the the, the creator of the universe whatever that looks like um and it's also it's actually called chineke and chi is the divine masculine but eke is the divine feminine but the the beautiful thing about it is that chi and eke cannot exist without each other so you can actually not exist without the divine masculine, which is like the thought, the like the, the intent, the creation, and then the divine feminine, which is actually the, the tangible, right? So like we do not exist without our bodies and without the spirit inside of our bodies, right? And both of those things are not better or worse than the other, but they're co they're interdependent on one another. So like when I think about like my trans identity, like I think about it more as like, how do I actually balance and have the energies of the universe, the masculine and feminine energies that are inside of me? And like how that has been validated by my ancestors for centuries. Um, so like the journey of like finding my trans identity, finding my, my cultural identity is like the journey that I've had of like finding my ancestral spirituality, which has just been fucking beautiful. Yeah. Yes. Oh. oh my God. It's one of those things that I, I'm like, I'm shaken every time I hear these stories of like the actions of like decolonization, the like westernization of like thought systems that we all adopt, like, especially even coming to America, like I think like mindsets like come from white supremacy that come from um, like, you know, settler like um, thought, thought systems mm -hmm. of like, you know, just, these horrendous histories, and I, I think it's one of those things where we owe it to our ancestors to unwork that. Like I feel like we're actually doing the spirit work that we need to be doing as trans people, as TGI people, accepting ourselves, loving ourselves, believing in who we are. Like it's actually like an act of anti-colonial colonialism, anti like it's an act of like anti-racism. Mm -hmm. Like it's one of those weird moments where like. I honestly like Uluchi, like you hit it off like nail on the head. Like when you started coming to these realizations, like I had a very similar experience and this might be a little dark, but like I was so angry for the longest time. Like because I just feel like something was robbed of me. Like the more I studied of like my home culture and like what like westernization and like um like centralizing of like white supremacy and like like all that has done to my culture. Um, and what was it, um, like uh, Christian, what is it? Christian ideologies and things like that and like missionary ideologies, mm -hmm. like what has done to my people, my culture is like so insanely heartbreaking. And like, I just remember feeling so much anger towards mm -hmm. that because I feel like it truly felt like they were robbing my ability to be free. Mm -hmm. and, 
intense. It's mm-hmm. like taking a long time to get through that anger. Where I feel like I was like, you don't go through those seven stages of grief. Jane. I was in the anger phase for a long time. Like, and I think with my journey towards like the intersection of my identity as like um, South Korean, as like like Korean in itself, like South Korea is like a made up state. Like, even though we understand that there's a difference between North and South Korea, mm-hmm. how did that become? Like, it was a war, like it was over a war that was caused by like Western imperialism and like Eastern imperialism. So it's just like one of those things that like why do we this this thing like why is there this like itch in yourself that like you're constantly reaching for your identity for your spirit mm-hmm. and trying to honor it, but then like we are taught through Westernization through like racism that we can't accept that, um, and I think. It actually boils down, it's just very distant from all of this in English, which, you know, I learned at a young age, but like, it's not my mother tongue. And um, I remember being happy with my and my dad would make me, like, he didn't want me ever to sound like I was like, English second language, he never was. So he'd make me read from the dictionary until I got it right. So like, um, and one of the words that I remember, I don't go into like entom- etymology of like English words, is the word haunt or haunting. Um, and to haunt actually comes from the root of the term to revisit a space. Mm-hmm. Um, and it actually comes from a distant root of the word home. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I'm actually haunted in some ways, but in the way that like, I feel like my ancestors are crying for me to come to an understanding that there's a home inside of me and a home into my spirit and that mm-hmm. I have to accept myself. And that like, that is my duty and like, I, it's like, when you talk about spaces that are haunted, it means that there was once life there. So what do you do? So for me, I, I think that that's where my identity intersections come in, where like, I feel that being a trans woman, being um, South Korean diaspora, being this person who was brought up, like moving around everywhere, is just my method of like honoring my ancestors is living my authentic truth. So, um, but not to make it dark. <laughs> like, I just think it's like, when you said that, it was just like, oh, thank God someone brought that up. Like, it's just like, I just feel like I go through the anger phase too much. <laughs> there was something but, that you said in there that I really resonated with. And it was, you were talking about anger and like the stages of grief. And I think that like, I went through that same, I, I think I'm still going through that same phase of like just anger. Cause it's like, it was like violence and genocide was used to like, quell and like oppress our people in such disgusting ways that they gave up like their spiritual identity and like create like assimilated to a spiritual identity that they actually did not practice i think that just makes me so fucking angry because i'm like how do you someone down like inflict violence on them so much that they give up like the reasons that they believe in life like that is just disgusting right um and i i think the other point that i wanted to make that i think that you brought up was like thinking about how like trans people, specifically trans people of color, are always going to the stewards of our liberation because of the ways that um, oppression interest like specifically oppresses us, right? Like we are hit by westernization as far as our gender, as far as our culture, like how we love all of these things. So, so like we are so policed and oppressed that like if we, if the, if whoever has the pathway to liberation, it is going to be us, specifically trans, trans femmes of color, right? Because patriarchy affects y'all in a different way than it, do, than it affects me. But like, always thinking that like, y'all trans women of color will be the stewards of our liberation. And I will just like specifically say black trans women will be the stewards of our liberation because they are hit by so many systems of oppression that like a lot of us are not. Yes. <laughs> I also like I also think that the reason why they hated so I I don't even think I know the reason <laughs> is that black trans people, black trans women, mm-hmm. the reason why they are hated is because they are the most powerful beings mm-hmm. in truth. Like how you live in a world that actively tries to destroy you day by day. Like that you are moving towards like the liberation for all people. So like mm-hmm. Like, you're not, like, what? Like, and that's the whole reason we're here. Like, the district in Mm -hmm. itself, like, this platform, like, why we were brought together and, like, you know, we make a cute point to talk about these things is because three Black trans women came together and was just, like, there needs to be a space for us, by us, 
and like we'll make it right here in the mm-hmm. heart of San Francisco. Yeah. And like um, I know that not all of us are particularly in the Bay, yeah. but like it's one of those things that like again the dream is that this place will exist hundred years, two hundred years, three hundred, like three hundred, four, whatever millennium, and like people can turn to this space as where they'll they'll be able to be at home. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I want to go a little time. I did want to leave a section um, for, I know that there are currently in like some viewers in and out, um, there's going to be a time for Q&A for those of you who are watching actively right now. Um, so feel free to drop your questions and answers in the comments, or sorry, drop your questions in the comments um, and we'll plug them at the end of the segment. Um, I had about two more questions prepped, but I think I want to skip to the last question if everyone's okay with that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I want to skip to that one because I think it's going to bring us to a point where we can talk about the future and like what our futures hold. And then once we're done with that, we'll open it up for a Q and A. And then mm-hmm. if there's um, no no more like sort of questions that pop up, we're, we can open it up to us to ask each other questions and mm-hmm. then close out promptly at mm-hmm. seven thirty. Mm-hmm. Um, but in any case, let's go to the next one. Um, did we have any other comments on the intersections um, before we move to the final question of tonight? Perfect. All right, so I would love to hear, I want to hear about something beautiful that you find in your identities as folks who are at the intersection of being um, transgender and being an immigrant or diaspora. And the reason I picked this in particular, and I, I mean beauty in the sense that like, you know, a flower is beautiful, but shit is beautiful because it sprouts flowers. So like, I want full, full war, like anything, full war, yeah. like anything about your identities. Like, and I want, we, we have about, I'm gonna say, we have about 20 minutes. So, mm-hmm. um, and then we'll leave the latter portion for questions, but any of the audience questions, mm-hmm. so. Um, I would love to start this one because I wrote this down. Um, so I see it in two, like, I guess let's say pillars again. Um, from I see it from a past lens. I see my the in, especially the intersectionality of my identities as a sort of a resume of resilience. You know, I can every time look back at that everything I've overcome and be like those are badges of honor for everything I've endured and everything I've continued to defy. Um, And then looking forward from a future lens, I see it as a playbook to controlling my destiny. I I see it as like, I haven't let any boundary, let it be gender, geographic or political define me and define what kind of life I was going to live. And so it's sort of a playbook to in any situation when I'm at a crossroad to choose my truest self, that I have done it before and I need to continue doing it again and again. Yes, I live, honestly, a resume of resilience, like, oof, yeah. Gets me, like, oh, gosh. Um, I would definitely say to attest to what Aishani just mentioned and also to tie into our past um, the answers to the previous question. Um, I just think we're, I think we're very poetic. Um, I think we are capable of transcending um, these boundaries that Aishani mentioned. Boundaries that were uh, placed on us by, you know, Western culture um, and limitations that we have on where we are geographically um, you know, financially, uh, you, you know, I, I, I think that we find a way to, uh, to turn all of that and make it into our own narrative and make it, um, and make it personal, um, which I think it's a very beautiful thing about trans people. Um, especially trans people that have come from, uh, backgrounds, um, that, are highlighted by um, hardship um, and misunderstanding. Um, I, I, I think, you know, I, I always try to bring this up every time I'm doing advocacy or I am speaking about, um, you know, being trans and also the trans community. 
Um, I think it's very important and I lead all of those um, um, speaking opportunities by saying that trans people are by far the most resilient and salient um, people that I've ever met. Um, and I think, you know, that is a very honest and very truthful statement uh, because I believe it because I am one and also from the community uh, of people that I've met like you all and you, you know, I think we have a very, uh, we have a very unique and special way of interpreting our experiences. Like what um, Aluchi mentioned about um, the mastery of the universe and also to what Juniper said about the haunting and, and you know, and being reminded that there's home within, uh, you know, like that sort of introspection, I think is not just, it, it, it does not fall on just anyone, you know? So I just wanted to say that, that I think that is a very beautiful aspect about our identities. Mm. Yeah, I love that. I think for me, like the most basic of our like intersecting identities and my identity is that I don't eat bland food. So I think that is amazing. I do not eat bland food. I love I love spicy food. Um, I like our fits, our cultures, our like beauty. Like this is actually a Nigerian fit. Just like yeah, that's point blank. Period. Like we are not bland people. Because like sometimes I'll be looking at white people, I'm like, y'all bland and you eat bland food. Um, but yeah, so that, and also I think like, just to bring it back, like, I think we exist because we know that a new world is possible. And I think that's fucking beautiful. And like, not only is a new world possible, but like we internalize that a new world is possible when we, like, when we validate our identities. So like when we validate our identities, like, we get other people to validate their identities. And I think that's just fucking beautiful. Um, and as trans people, like the way that we are able to like see ourselves in a way that the, the, the world does not see us is like a very, very beautiful aspect of like how we can actually live, how we survive. Um, and yeah, just like knowing that in my body, like I am resiliency. And I think for me, um, the reasons why I do this work is always like, I love kids. I love kids so much. Kids are, I will probably have like five children. Um, but like the reason why I do this work is so that trans kids that are existing now and that have not existed can actually live in a world in which they're validated more than I was. Right. Um, so like I am a testament to a little kid somewhere down the road that like you can be this and still be validated in who you are and your identity. And like that's what I fucking find beautiful is that I am existing for the future generation. Um, so the future generation can have like a person, a thing, uh, whatever to look at. And they can be like, wow, I can do that, too. And I can be that as well. Yes. Uh, I feel so good. <laughs> Again, I love children. Like I love babysitting. Like every time I'm around a kid, I'm just like, I just want to create a better world. Because like, yeah, it's insane. And honestly, rolling back from the conversation with Luchi, like my thing that I find beautiful about being trans, about being an immigrant, about being someone who has lived on the margins, who has been kind of seen as less than in society, mm -hmm. is that despite everything. I feel like we often see things like that hard in people. Like mm -hmm. when people get rejected, like who are not of our experience, they mm -hmm. often become hard, cold, rude, things like that. Mm -hmm. Like when you're speaking, Luchi, about you as a child and like telling you, like, oh, like if you like someone, if you have a crush, just you go kiss them. Like very cute, like very childlike. And you saying that, like, that was like not seen as normal or okay that you approached like a, a girl and like kissed them because they were assuming that you were this person and you are assuming that you should have to like this person because you're that person. Like to me that was, there was something so intrinsically wrong in that moment in my head and what that made me realize is that like my eyes and my heart because I am who I am are so open. Like that to me, red nothing, like that red just is beautiful to me. Like, like there was no moment in me that was just like, oh, like that's wrong. Like, you know what I mean? And I feel like for me, like that is the sort of root of who I am now 
is that I am so accepting. And I'm so, not even accepting, but like I, I savor that there are these beautiful different shapes of spirit that anyone can take and carry within themselves and carry into their lives. And like, there's never really been a moment where I feel that my first initial reaction is like a disgust in people. And I think that's what like Westernization, what like, like anti-blackness, what, anti what racism has taught us to do. And I'm so happy that I'm in that point. Like, again, I'm not perfect, but like, I think in any point that like my first reaction is not to reject. And I think that's the most beautiful part of me, is to understand. Um, we actually have a really beautiful question that will close out the talk for tonight. Um, it's from Nawandi Smith. I'm going to pull down the banner and pull up the question. Thank you, Nawandi, and I'm so glad that you joined us. Um, to listen about um, these three other beautiful folks' experiences. But um, the question for you folks is, who are the people and experiences at your back that inspire you to do the work that you do? And I think, I agree, like the past, the present, and the future, all is within us at the same time. So I'm glad that we're looking at the past too, not just the future. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's all I know on these questions. Give them a yeah. to thank them. Anyone who wants to jump to respond can respond. I can, I can start uh, because I know Nandi. Um, <laughs> Nandi is one of those people for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, Nandi is a really dope organizer, activist, is the organizing director at BYP 100. Shout out to y'all. Um, right. So Nandi is definitely one of those people for me. Um, yeah, and I think about like my grandma. Um, yeah, my grandma was a badass in many rights, but I think the one thing that I remember about her is that um, she lived with us for a long time in America, but she never learned how to speak English. Um, and I always thought it was weird. I was like, why aren't you learning English? Like you're in America, blah, blah, blah. And I was I was like, like later on in life, I was like, that was actually a sign of resilience to like actually make me speak my, my, native, my native language. Um, so like whenever I think about the reasons why I do this work, um, I always think about her. Um, I have her on my altar. And then also um, the people that inspire me to do the work that I do, I have to shout out my mentor, my co-director, Olao Saze, um, who has like been basically like an uncle because he's like double my age. I think he's like 54 at this point. Um, he probably isn't, but he seems like he's 54. Um, who's been like a mentor to me. Adaku Uta is one of the first Igbo trans people that I've ever met um, and is also my coach and mentor. Um, and yeah, all of the members of BLMP, um, I'm sorry, my garbage can opens up voice command, <laughs> but um, all the members of BLMP, so the people that I do this work for, queer and trans black immigrant folks, um, they really do inspire me to do the work that I do. Um, locally, I do work with Black Vision, so I have to shout out my crew at Black Visions, um, who has like really taught me like what does, what does it mean to actually be in rigorous like work with people um, we went through a very traumatic time last year in Minneapolis, um, and those were the people that I had at my back. Um, so always, always, always shout out to my second political home, Black Visions. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much, Luci, and thank you, Nandi Smith, and I apologize for mispronouncing your gorgeous name. So, um, and then is there any other uh, responses? We have, uh, we have about, 10 minutes and then we can close out with any final comments. So you have I, I, I wanted to say something. Yes. Um, you know, um, someone that really made an impact for me and that really inspired me to do the work that I do now um, is in this panel, Aishani. Um, I met Aishani, um, I met Aishani like over a year ago. And she's just like stormed into my life, uh, fire on her heels and a limelight over her. Um, over her. And um, she was just very bold and very striking in her opinions and who she was and what she wanted and you know where she came from and how that um, informed her. And, um, and you know, that definitely was a huge, uh, um, monumental experience for me 
at meeting someone that was so um, was so grounded and was so in touch with who she was as a trans person and also um, as an immigrant herself. And um, because of how vocal and how powerful she sounded and looked and was and is, uh, that did inspire me to uh, open my eyes and expand my horizons and um, be bold and confident as well and you know in who I was and where I came from and what and what I wanted to um, to do uh, so I just wanted to thank Aishani for for being that for me um, because that did it did give me life and it did um, sort of um, propped me up and, um, you know, when doors opened, I was like, what would I show me do? Um, so, um, yeah, thank you, Aishani. Oh my God, you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> you make me cry, girl. <laughs> I'm gonna be so cheesy and put it back to you too, because you're one of those people for me. I have, I, I hold two, like when, when this question came, I like literally, had these two visions. One was Janet Mock and one was Jupiter. <laughs> um, and I, I it, it was the same for you. Like when we were introduced by our mutual friend Bryce, you, you were just so vibrant in this, in your existence and just so striking is the right word for you as well. Um, and I feel like you're more striking in your sense of self than I was at the time. And I feel like I've learned a lot really observing you and just seeing you, I guess, trot around trampling the world in exactly what you want to do and who you want to be. And it's so, so inspiring. And on the same path, like I have never met Jan Janet Mock, but reading her books give, gives me that same, I see that in, what I see in you, this this very strong sense of self, the striking person and the striking energy that will walk out the door and define who she is, every interaction she has. And that's, that's my juice for life. <laughs> I love you, thank I, you. I love it, trans love us here. Oh, <laughs> no! <laughs> Yeah, no, it's always like so many things just like all around the community and it always feels like, honestly, it always feels like whenever I, I'm a part of these kinds of panels, there's just this like radiant positivity and like in particular to this one, I value like um, just the fact that we have such a deep connection with our community mm -hmm. because it does, mm -hmm. it's our home and I think it's, it's one of those things where I hear y'all like, giving each other props, giving you love and stuff. And like, I can't think of any other like nonprofit right now <laughs> that just like would sit here and just like, you know, have a tea for tea love fest <laughs> um, actively happening in the comments and things like that. But I think in particular, like, again, like I want to say first and foremost, like we have we have a duty to honor our elders, to honor our ancestors, um, you know, to continually fight towards the world where um, those coming into our world as it is now can find a place that is more accepting, that is going to see them and celebrate their spirits and never reject them and give them space, give them platform, give them love. Um, and I think with what Luchi's saying is that part of it is like, uh, the question brought up the work, and I think like what I love is not like not only do we know how to have a good time and have a love fest, is that like every person in this room, all of our ancestors, all our elders have worked like incredibly hard, and that's why these organizations are like existing, they're surviving, they're popping up. Like I feel like um, the more and more days I go by, I feel like we get more and more interconnected with resources that speak to the experiences that need to be recognized and uplifted. So um, like Uchi's work with the um, BLMP is just like, phenomenal. Like 
even just you speaking to the the, the um, uprisings in Minneapolis last year and as they continue, just like recognizing that we didn't get here without a fight. Mm -hmm. And I think that knowing that like we always we always have so much love for each other and we hold each other up so often. Mm -hmm. But when push comes to shove, we get in line and we know how to protect each other. I think that's what like the district is aiming to do with creating space. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the transgender district, um, the history of our district is that it was founded by three um, black trans women um, in relation to uh, the Compton's cafeteria riots of, I believe, 1966, where it was one of the first um, documented uprisings in the United States of uh, particularly black trans people and trans people of color against police brutality. So like, it's like one of those things where folks are being kicked out of a space that they were, they were playing in. And our people are just like, this is it now, like we need this space, this is our home. Um, and I wanna like specifically shout out this moment, um, the queen of Compton's cafeteria that just passed and honor her by um, saying her name, Felicia Flames. Um, she, is one of the reasons why we're even here. Mm -hmm. So I want to honor her, speak her name, and give her her, give her, her roses every day. Mm -hmm. like this year, like forever. This forever. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and then um, I, I'm so just stoked to be surrounded by people who are inspired by each other, who are doing the work and will continue to do the work until we ourselves will become trans elder. <laughs> so I'm just so stoked. And, um, there's about 15 minutes. Um, I haven't had any um, particular questions pop up in the feed, um, but I would like any of you to make any final comments if you'd like, and then we can close out whenever um, we finish up the time. Wait, do we have time for one question? Because I have one for all of us. Yeah, no, absolutely. We Amazing. So, you know how we talked a little bit about sort of being the blueprint. Like we didn't see versions of ourselves and had to kind of be that. And part of that process is getting in touch with your internal compass. So I'm just really curious on how each of you connect with your internal compass and listen to it and let it guide you when there's nothing, not much in front to look forward to, you know? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I can start. Um, yeah, so I think my journey of coming out, like when I first came out to myself, it was like, okay, I am a lesbian and I am butch. So I am like a stud. So I am masculine. And then um, had a lot of like gender dysphoria and came out as trans. And then I'm like, okay, well, I'm trans and I'm masculine. Am I a trans man? but that also did not resonate with me. And I was like, actually, that's not what I want to do. Um, so then I was still trans masculine, but I was like super masculine, but I'm like, but I'm non-binary, but I'm super masculine. And then only recently have I been able to like tap into like a lot of the femininity that I know that I have. Um, and I think that that has just come from actually just the work and being around other people too. I know you're, I, see, I know the question was without, without other people, but I think that there are people that I'm growing in tandem with. Um, like some people were like, they also had identified as trans men and now they're non-binary and they started using they, they he pronouns and they, they're still trans mask, but they don't see themselves as a binary uh, trans person. Um, but yeah, it's just been a lot of like deep reflection, self-reflection, learning more about like my culture has also helped me learn about myself. Um, and yeah, just doing the work and being exposed to like different types of transness even has helped expand and open my mind and like be able to like speak to my internal compass. Um, I, sorry, no, I just want to say like, I love like the idea that Trans, transness is not like a destination either. Yeah, like, it's, it's like not one and done. I think there's that like misconception of like, oh, like I'm this, I'm ready, yeah. I'm done. Like exactly. But like it's interesting. It's a, definitely a journey. And, like, yeah, it's like wisdom. Like yeah. it's like never attainable in a way, but you're constantly pursuing it. You know what I'm saying? 
but you were going to speak. I didn't want to interrupt. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I, I definitely agree with um, um, Aluchi mentioned about you know being surrounded by many um, um, trans experiences, and I can also say the same thing about me. Uh, what what uh, what helps me be in touch with my internal compass is uh, being surrounded with people um, that can. Um, informed me on their experiences because through their experiences and their actions and what they've been through in turn informs me and informs the way that I want to, um, you know, live life or um, walk, you know, through the world. Um, and also something that has really helped me be in touch with my internal compass, um, you know, especially as an immigrant person that I am sort of limited to a certain geographical space. Um, I I tend to turn to like like film and you know like books to help me transport to another environment to uh, with you know to be connected with other people. Um, that it 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 helps me put on this like sort of hat on me of if I were to be in this place. Or in, if if I were to be going through this, what would I do? How would I feel? Um, and it's something that I have been able to uh, get in touch um, through movies. For example, um, I I love saying that I love Roma, which is this film about um, a domestic worker in Mexico during the 1970s. It it you know that film allowed me to be more connected with my mother and with her experience and her history, and also the experience of, of my grandmother and the women that came before her. Um, and it's also for this new film that I saw, uh, and it's just gonna be like, girl, um, I, I, I recently saw Minari, but Minari is also one of those films that has also um, un, um, fed my narrative and helped me understand uh, the importance of family and where you come from. Um, uh, there's this line in the movie that says, uh, Minari girls anywhere. And I think that's a very uh, beautiful way of saying that um, uh, family in resilience can manifest anywhere and grow anywhere. Um, so, you know, just like those are the ways that allow me to be in touch with my, with my internal compass, with things that um, make me feel vulnerable and make me feel more open-minded and have an open heart. And I think that's a very beautiful thing. Yeah, I love that. Oh. Hey, Shani, this like the idea of a compass to me is so interesting because honestly, I don't know how I got here. Like I, always, like, I feel like it's one of those moments where I look back upon my life and I'm like, how the, how the hell did I get where I'm at? Like, and I just realized, like, I feel like I'm constantly, like, a compass near a magnet. Mm. Or I just spin, you know? And I realized, like, when things spin like that, like, to me, like, it isn't about, like, tasking yourself with the idea of constantly knowing what's next. Like, I'm not the type of person that tries to learn by, you know, like, overthinking about what's actually going to happen. Like, that's not how reality works. Mm -hmm. For me, like, when you spin, it turns into a dance. So for me, like, I like the idea of that when I move forward in my life, in my transition, in my journey as an immigrant, that I am, you know, when we dance, we don't think about what we're stuck in. Um, unless, of course, we're doing some sort of thing. There is, like, choreography, but it's in the sense that there is a spirit to it, that you have to step in your own way. You have your own people, that you're going in the direction that feels right for your body. It feels right for your spirit. And for me, like, movement in itself is the meaning for me rather than the sort of idea of the destination. Um, so I feel like for me, it's just like, this sounds really crazy, but like, um, my dad would have a saying that, like, you're not dead if you're moving. And it's just one of those things where. It sounds pretty dark, but in my mind, like we are blessed to have this here in this life and have come to where we're at and like come from where we're where we're from, that we have that blessing of being able to move around, to have 
ability to know that we can move in any direction that we see fit. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's my kind of internal compass because I honestly, I'm confused nine times out of 10. <laughs> if I seem to have my, my stuff together, but honestly, like, I feel like that's a big thing, a misconception in transition. And yeah. you know, like immigration, like it feels like people think it's very linear. But like, damn, if there's not days where I'm just like, what the hell am I doing? So I just think of it as like a very absurdist idea that like I'm just enjoying the time that I'm spending on this earth and like going in the direction of like, yeah. so, um, I love that. I thank you so much for I love seeing your like, sharing. Answering your own question before we close out. We have about five minutes and then we'll close out. Yeah, no, of course. I, my in, internal compass, I completely resonate with this like magnet in front of your compass and like turning around all the time and being confused. Um, my internal compass, I think it's partly self-reflection. I mean, there's a lot of self-reflection involved in that, but also I love what Jupiter mentioned about transporting yourself through media and using experiences that um, you are not necessarily living, but using it to guide you. Be like, I like that, I don't like that, but I've never lived that, right? Mm -hmm. And it's such a cool thing that we're able to do so readily in today's world with you know easy access to media and people from all over the world. Um, I'm an ENFJ and I, we're known to be like always looking at other people's lives because we always are wishful of, of what different lives are like. And so I really try to, there's a lot of research work involved before I do the listening portion to my internal compass. Um, and it's facilitated even more better in today's world that we live in. So I love that. Yes, I honestly thank you so much for that final question. I feel, I feel like we, we went on the whole journey this whole entire talk. Yeah, we did. So thank you both so much. Um, thank you for gracing us with your Leo energy, both of you, um, your birthday twins. Um, if you want to shout out your birthday, just in case people <laughs> need to know, so that you can get some gifts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now well, the time before we close out. Just kidding. If you want to, you're welcome to. But um, again, we want to thank you so much, both as you know, like both as just you know, TGI identified immigrants, but also as representatives of the district that y'all are doing the work, living your lives authentically, and yeah, it's just it's just phenomenal being surrounded by people with such rich stories. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you again to Aluchi. Mm -hmm. Thank you again to Aishani. Mm -hmm. Thank you to Jupiter. Thank you to me. Yeah. And uh, yeah. feel yeah. free to tune in to our next segment yeah. for the home series. Yeah. It's happening in two weeks um, on Monday. And yes. it will be covering um, the topic of transitioning um, for folks during a pandemic. So it's going mm -hmm. to talk about um, difficulties that people might have faced or unique situations. Um, for folks who had like you know anything from surgeries infected to um, learning how to like love wearing a mask all the time, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um, feel free to tune in um, to our beautiful audience yeah. and um, feel free to uh, hit up Uchi and Aishani um, if you'd like. Uh, would you like to shout out your Insta handles or social media handles at all, or um, your organizations one last time for the audience? Totally, yeah. My Instagram handle is aishani.maz, Aishani Maz. Um, yeah, and I also want to say thank you so much, Jupiter and Juniper, for ho ho facilitating and hosting this. This is we had we like transcended conversation today. Beautiful. And then, Oluchi, would you like to give one last shout out? Yeah. Um. So BLMP is just blmp.org, uh, and you will find all the information that you need there. Uh, my Instagram slash Twitter, even though I don't use my Twitter, is just uh, Luchi07 or L-U-C-H-I-07, if you want to follow me. I'm not that interesting. I never post, but I will follow back. <laughs> yes, I love that. But I, I don't know. After this conversation, I think you're not interesting. Yes, so you are. Don't be lying. <laughs> I was like, just <laughs> uh, anyway. Yeah. Um, I'll close this out. This ends this uh, first broadcast of the home series. 
and y'all have a lovely evening. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.